So what I'd like to do is talk about um, an area that I work in, and when I'm asked what I do, uh, the, the two-word answer is I'm a water engineer. And what does that mean? It means that I work on water. Is there enough of it, and is it safe to drink? So that's what I work on. I also am the director of the uh, National Science Foundation Engineering Research Center for reinventing the nation's urban water infrastructure. And we're in our sixth year now, and we call ourselves Renew It. It's a collaboration between Stanford, Berkeley, Colorado School of Mines, and New Mexico State. So what I'll be talking about here is uh, reinventing uh, water supply uh, for dry cities. Let's use the example of California. And I'll be drawing also uh, from some work that we're doing in our um, engineering research center as well. So my take home message is today uh, that uh, when we talk about water and water problems, all of our solutions are, and the problems are local. And what I mean by that is that the Bay Area has its water challenges that are quite different than, say, Southern California, that are different than San Diego, that are different than the Front Range. Uh, and the reason for this is because of climate conditions and also because of existing infrastructure and uh, politics and policies. I'd like to use examples, though, from California to show how we can have a better water supply future by reducing dependence on imported water. You may know that the water that comes to the Stanford campus is imported from Yosemite National Park through an aqueduct system. Uh, and that the way we can reduce dependency on imported water is to have a portfolio of options for our water supply in the future. Or another way of saying that there isn't just one thing we can do or should do, there's sort of a multi, there's several things we ought to pay attention to. There isn't one specific thing that we can do that will solve our, our water problems. And in uh, looking to the future, we need uh, partnerships to uh, evaluate ideas at, um, at a believable scale. Um, and we call that a test bed or pilot plant. And we also need decision support tools. In other words, to ask the question, well, if we're successful with a new technology or a new approach, how does that build out? How does that technology diffuse? So that's, uh, these, these are the main messages today. But I thought I would start with a um, uh, slide that says, where do we get our water in California? Uh, this is what happens in a, in a wet year. And we can say this is our, like currently. Um, our, our water comes from three sources. Uh, one of it is uh, snowpack, snow melt. This year we have a generous snowpack. Uh, we also get water from uh, the ground and, and from reservoirs. So you can think of reservoirs as just like uh, rain that's uh, collected. And in a normal year, uh, these contribute about equally to our water supply in California. And I show the snowpack, the cloud, the reservoirs, and the groundwater is pretty high. But we, you know, we've just um, experienced five years of drought. And what happens here then is this picture changes. Uh, there's no snowpack. Uh, there's not much rain. The reservoirs are empty. And we rely on uh, um, groundwater to make up the deficits. And the groundwater, uh, the water table as we call it, drops. So that's what happens in a, in a, in a dry year. Now, in the... The 20th century, we, I would say that we sort of limped along. Uh, when we got into a drought, you'd hope that, well, if we can get by for a few years, uh, that'll, that'll solve, uh, our problems will be solved when it starts raining again. But in the 21st century, we realize we're really at the edge of, uh, or at the limit of what the existing infrastructure can, can provide in terms of our water. Um, and Oftentimes, when we think about water and solutions for the future, it might be tempted, tempting to say, our, our water problems would be solved if, and then you point to somebody or some place. You know, if they would change their behavior, uh, then that would, we, we'd, we wouldn't have our problem. And since I'm pointing south, I could say, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the problem are those big homes in Beverly Hills with those big, you know, they didn't wash their cars every day, everything would be fine. Well, um, another, the, the reality is, is we're all part of the problems and we're all part of the solution. We're all part of the problem, we're all part of the solution. And uh, 
Governor Brown uh, has emphasized this. Uh, this is in 2015 now. This was when the drought emergency was declared. The metaphor is Spaceship Earth, Brown said. In Spaceship Earth, you reuse everything. Um, and he's basically saying we all have to work together to solve the problem. Um, and he uses this analogy of Spaceship Earth. Now, I was just finishing graduate school when Governor Brown was running for presidency. This is, you have to go back a few years now. But he used that expression, Spaceship Earth, and he got the moniker Governor Moonbeam. Now, back then, if you said weird, weird things, it really did kick you out of the election. You were, uh, <laughs> and so he got, he got dubbed Governor Moonbeam, and I think his candidacy lasted two months. Uh, but the, the way I look at this then is from 76 to 17, look at all those years that have intervened. Now no one's laughing. We actually see that there's a, uh, we, we, we understand, at least in terms of water, that, that we do have to think collectively and um, work collectively on our problems. So this is a schematic that shows how we designed our water systems in the 20th century. Basically, it's taking water from, uh, say, a reservoir or a river or groundwater, treating it, using it in the city. The city will have runoff and wastewater treat that, and then it's discharged. So it's kind of like a, a one pass um, of, of water. Now in the 20th century, or excuse me, 21st century, we, we have a different look at this, that we think about uh, recycling water, uh, collecting storm water. And so this drawing gets a little more complicated now, where the wastewater can be treated to a high degree. It could be reused for potable or maybe uh, or potable or non-potable uses. It could go in the ground and then that way find its back into our water supply. We can take runoff, which is storm water, which we have a lot of, we've had a lot of this winter. Think about ways of collecting that, treating it, and making that be part of our water supply. And that's a source of water we haven't used before, um, particularly in California, where the focus on storm water has been on uh, uh, flood control management. In other words, getting it to the ocean or bay as quick as you could. So the 21st century then is this one of, um, of closing the loops. Now, how do we actually implement this and where does the vision come for any particular city? And I, I'm going to use the example from California that to me illustrates the power of local governance and that if we look at some mayors in our state, they're actually forward looking and are thinking we have to solve our problems. Uh, here you can look at uh, uh, Mayor Falconer in San Diego. Um, and this is not the desal plant in Carlsbad, but this is a water recycling facility that they're testing now uh, to take wastewater, then put it into a reservoir. And from a reservoir, it would then become part of the water supply. Or Mayor Garcetti in Los Angeles. Um, Los Angeles has the objective of reducing their need for imported water by half. And what Mayor Garcetti, the uh, well, previous mayor, um, set that goal and what Mayor Garcetti did was uh, advance the time for that by, by 10 years. So Los Angeles is dependent for a large part of its water uh, coming from Northern California or from the Colorado River. And so what Mayor Garcetti is saying, in the future, we want to re reduce our dependence on those sources, reduce dependency by half. And that has to be made up by water recycling and by stormwater capture. Or Mayor Sam Licardo here in San Jose. Now, this is where I'm taking my class this afternoon uh, for a tour of the Silicon Valley Advanced um, Water Purification Facility. That has a lot of words strung together. But what, what is being done here is um, wastewater from the big uh, uh, San Jose Santa Clara treatment plant is being processed through a series of steps to produce water that's essentially drinking water quality. And I guess uh, Mayor Sam here is getting ready to show that you can actually drink that. But the point is, is that um, this is where I think the action is and where cities and counties see the need to be aggressive in terms of how they think about the future of their water supplies and say, we have, to, we have to move on our own accord, of course, being very thoughtful. 
Uh, now, to put this in context, in the, era, in the era in which I was a graduate student and just became a professor, the federal government took a, ha, had a big role in the, uh, through the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act in uh, building um, uh, infrastructure for, for water treatment and wastewater treatment. Those days are over. We're just not going to see them again. In fact, I guess we could say from Washington, we just haven't had a lot of guidance. Uh, and so here is the cities taking the action themselves, or the governor. You can look at like Governor Brown setting this, uh, uh, this drought declaration and asking everyone to cut back on their use of water. So when we think about the future of the water supply, um, uh, uh, example I'll use here is the idea of four faucet taps where you could think water coming from stormwater harvesting. This would be the water that you would see on your city streets and uh, concrete channels going to the ocean or the bay. Um, water reuse and uh, being much more aggressive about that. Uh, water use efficiency and then desalination. Now desalination means getting the salt out of water. It doesn't have to be uh, seawater. It could be water that's just a little too salty for uh, potable use. So let's take a look at, uh, at, at one of these. This is the water use efficiency. And I, I, when I give talks to the general public about um, the water futures for California, something that always comes up first is, well, what if we just use a little less water? Can we conserve our way out of the problem? And then Governor Brown asked um, all the urban areas to reduce their water use by uh, uh, 25%. Um, in, in uh, 2015 to 2016. And so this is a report from the State Water Resources Control Board that shows that as, uh, essentially for each month, you, the average over all those months is we really did achieve this 25% statewide reduction in urban use of water. And that comes from conservation. It comes from um, paying attention to how we use water for landscaping. That's a major thing in our area. And then not, not being wasteful. There are other prob programs like installing um, um, low flow or low flush toilets and that sort of thing. But the main, the main place where we could make a difference here is being thoughtful about repairing leaks, not taking long showers, and thinking about the outdoor use of water. So, so that's the good news. Well, um, I live on the Stanford campus. I live about, about a half a mile that way. And then I got this interesting letter this summer. And uh, this letter is from Joe Stegner. And he says, Dear Dick, you've done such a great job of conserving water by 25%. I'm going to have to raise your rates by 29%. So uh, there it is. Uh, this, say, uh, this is to the campus users, residential leaseholders may increase 29%. The rate increase is due to the decrease in water use. And so as uh, my neighbor professor, Ali Baim, says, is there anything that uh, we use less of and we pay more for? Well, you know, I think the analogy is you we're all used to the gas pump, you know, at the gas station. If you get a more fuel efficient car that you use you, you don't pay as much for your gas. But what happens with the water? It's it's not priced appropriately. Our our water charges are on dollars per thousand gallons. So even if I use no water, we still have to pay for the pipes and pumps that are in the street and the staff to keep all of that going. On the Stanford campus, and I wrote a, by the way, if you want to read an editorial about this, you can do that. Um, on the Stanford campus, about one third of our water bill is, um, is, is for the water. The other two thirds is for all the infrastructure. So this is, a, this is an, uh, an issue here that comes up that if we use less water, we're going to have to change the way in which we price water so that we pay for the commodity part of it and we pay for the fixed cost part of it. But, you know, intellectually, we kind of know this, but it's, you know, it's another thing to get a letter like that in the mail and you say, yes, it hits home. So let's take a look at uh, 
stormwater harvesting. Now I mentioned uh, stormwater harvesting means collecting the runoff from the urban area and capturing it and treating it and using it in a way that can contribute to our water supply. We don't really do that in Northern California. In Southern California, there's some spreading basins like this. Uh, this is the Rio Hondo uh, spreading basin. It's near the San Gabriel River. Uh, there are a series of spreading basins right near the base of the San Gabriel Mountains. So for reference, it would be like if you were in downtown LA, uh, uh, not look towards the ocean, but look back towards the mountains, then those spreading basins are inland about 20 miles from the ocean, roughly. Uh, and um, th these were built some years ago to capture um, water behind dams and then release this into places where the geology is right to help, re to help replenish the aquifers that, su that supply the water for Los Angeles. But the distance from here to the ocean, in other words, that sort of top part of the picture, that distance is about 20 miles. And that's where the st that, that storm water is not captured. That's the water that falls on the urban hardscape, the, the roofs, the driveways, uh, industrial property, freeways, and the like. That water is not captured. And that's an opportunity for us in the future. So this is a plot that shows for the city of Los Angeles where they are today with uh, capture of water and spreading basins and incidental recharge. Now, you don't have to pay to so much attention to the units here. It's, uh, it's in thousands of acre feet. But this shows where the city could be with uh, a sort of a conservative approach to additional stormwater capture or a more aggressive approach to stormwater capture. The point is, is that if you're, if you're sort of aggressive on the stormwater capture side, you could provide maybe a quarter or, or so of the water for the city of Los Angeles. And that's water that's currently not being used. So when Mayor Garcetti says, we'd like to cut our, uh, our requirement for imported water by half, a majority of that could come just from capturing stormwater that, that's not being caught today. Now there's several problems with, we, with capture stormwater. Um, one of them has to do with scale and costs. Some of you may be familiar with rain barrels. Um, rain barrels and small cisterns actually don't work in our climate, in a Mediterranean climate. The reason is, is because they will fill up, uh, like recently with the rains, but you need that water later. You need it like six or eight months later. So you, you, need, a, you need a storage device. Um, so if you look at the cost here, and this is a scale of uh, cost per acre foot against acre feet captured, these um, larger systems, like I just showed, are very cost efficient. Uh, smaller systems uh, at the scale of a home or street or neighborhood uh, are, are attractive for public support and engagement. And also, not every system in the city can be big like that. The, the, the land doesn't exist really to do those great big ones anymore. But you get the idea here that um, if I want to make a difference in the amount of water that I catch, I need, I need sort of neighborhood and bigger scale systems. But to gain public support for this, you also need to do things at the scale of a street with curbs and plantings and that sort of thing. There's another issue here, and that's the one of storage. Now, here I'm showing a picture of uh, a cistern that was built for an environmental group in Los Angeles. The environmental group is called Tree People. It's kind of a funny name, but they're very influential. They used to have a long name, which I don't even remember. But when they would tell people what they did, they said, oh, you're the people that plant the trees. And so they changed their name to Tree People. That's what they did. But anyway, um, with, with assistance from LA Department of Water and Power, they built this stormwater collection basin here at their visitor center. So this is like an a, a, a educational facility. And it, it shows what can happen if you can capture the stormwater. And they can use that captured stormwater then for irrigation of the trees around their property. 
the, the problem is it's just too much, uh, uh, it, it's too expensive to do that. Another one is, is there's a question of contaminants here where we have, uh, uh, in urban runoff, we have a whole series of chemicals that come from automobile tires and, and industrial facilities and the like. So an approach then for the future would be to think about a system that would comprise a capture, uh, a treat, and a, and a recharge. And I show this in an engineering sense here. Uh, but what might this look like? This is a site we're working in, in Los Angeles where we are um, working with the city and the Bureau of Sanitation, the Flood Control District, to convert uh, a large uh, former rock quarry into a stormwater capture treatment system. And you can see that when this is built out, it looks very park-like. You have a reservoir there, or wetlands and play fields and the like. And what we're looking at is how we could treat that runoff so that when it goes in the ground, it's... Uh, it, it's not going to cause a groundwater contamination problem. And we're doing work in the field here. Uh, that's a picture of us uh, with our LA partners uh, taken in August. And then a picture of now setting up this trailer in the field where we're looking at different combinations of media to help filter that water. And the idea then is to see how we can collect and, and cleanse the storm water. On the water reuse side, we do have systems in place where the main wastewater treatment plants will produce water for non-potable use. Um, that goes into a distinctive colored pipe called the purple pipe. And right here for the uh, San Jose Municipal, uh, San Jose Santa Clara um, uh, water treatment, wastewater treatment plant, there is this purple pipe system that takes that water back uh, to different parts of San Jose. The problem here is that rebuilding that reverse infrastructure is very expensive. And I'd say we've kind of explored the, about the limit of this, that it's a, a system that's probably just too expensive to expand this out on any, any more than what we've already done. The other problem is, is that the water is salty uh, and that you pump that water back uphill. This is an example of a facility near um, the Los Angeles airport that produces recycled water for use by local industry. And I just wanted to point out that uh, they produce five flavors of water, not just one kind of water, but water to make uh, uh, low and high pressure steam, cooling towers, groundwater recharge, and for irrigation. The future here of um, a lot of this water recycling is going to be what we would call full advanced treatment. And that's what my class will see this afternoon when we visit the Silicon Valley uh, Advanced Water Purification Facility. But it's taking wastewater that's been treated and then run it through microfiltration and two other steps of reverse osmosis and UV light. And, uh, and that can produce water that's now very high quality. So this is essentially drinking water quality. It may not be. Um, it doesn't mean it will go right into your drinking water supply, but it could go into a reservoir or into the ground and then find its way back to our uh, taps in sort of an indirect way. Now, the problem with this is that the water that we have currently available is from these large main uh, wastewater treatment plants. And for example, in Los Angeles here, we have this plant that treats the water for the city and then this big plant over here that takes, uh, treats the water for the county itself. So if you want to do a water reclamation and put that water around the county, and if your idea is that, well, we're going to reclaim our water here at the main plant, then you're left with a picture that looks like this. And this is what's been proposed by the Metropolitan Water District. You would have one great big water recycling plant and then pumping this water many miles all over the county and also uh, far uphill and the like. Well, will this actually happen? Uh, I'm not sure, but that's, I, I kind of doubt it. But there, there's a different approach rather than having the one big plant. You say, well, what about decentralized water reclamation where you could imagine neighborhood scale water reclamation facilities? And a neighborhood might be something that is uh, big, and I should say more like a little village, big enough that you could capture the water and use it, and that there would be treat it, 
uh, and that uh, you, would, you could have staff around to run the facility. So um, this is a picture of uh, what we might do at Stanford, for example. And we are testing out this idea of decentralized facility or decentralized water reclamation with a facility that's being built over by Sarah Street. Now what this does, it allows us to produce um, um, water for non-potable uses, irrigation, say, uh, uh, flushing and that kind of thing. But it uh, saves having to build a five to six mile pipeline from our water quality control plant. Also, you don't have to pump water back uphill and the water is less salty. And when we think about water reuse, the main problem we have really is salts. Uh, the well, salts and viruses, but salts is a big thing. And the water down at the main water quality control plant is too salty for long-term irrigation. Um, we've built a facility um, over on Sarah Street to look at new technologies that use uh, advanced uh, uh, biological and membrane processes to treat the wastewater in a very compact facility, capturing the organics as, uh, as methane that could be used to help power the plant. And this is, a, this is a, 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 an example of the future of water reclamation, new technologies, decentralized systems. And we're, but in order to gain acceptance of this, we have to test things at scale, and that's what's being tested over there on Sarah Street. And then lastly, about desalination. Um, we, if, if we look at uh, wastewater desalination, uh, a large plant has just come online in Carlsbad, California. It's the uh, largest desal plant in the, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, but what you're doing here is you're taking seawater, running it through reverse osmosis. It takes a lot of energy in producing clean water. But we also do desalination over here at the Silicon Valley Advanced Water Purification Facility. There's a desalination step involved when you treat that water and bring it up to potable levels. So if you look at the energy intensity here of what it takes, including the wastewater treatment, uh, it's about one third of that for the um, seawater. So um, there, there, there are good reasons to think about wastewater reclamation using new technologies uh, and producing a very high quality water. And that can all be done at a fraction of the energy cost for desalination. And then lastly, in order to advance uh, these ideas, we need to be able to do things at scales. We, we need partnerships with utilities uh, to, who will step out and say, I will try this, like the Stanford campus saying, we will invest um, with an alumni gift, uh, uh, develop a facility to look at how we might reclaim our wastewater here. So the, again, just to summarize then, uh, what is it that's important here is um, the decision making uh, for, for new water futures. Um, we can think about combined water recycling, stormwater capture, for example. Stormwater use can contribute to our water supplies, but need to be done in a way that will protect groundwater. Recycling and en energy recovery, we can do it, but we have to be able to demonstrate things at scale. And, and that means we need support for test beds. Um, and, and university alone can't uh, pay for those facilities. We have to have partnerships, but it gives us a stepwise approach to change. Um, once you can go from a sort of a pilot plant to the first, say, uh, uh, demonstration plant, then an idea can take off from there because it's been de-risked. So that's the messages I wanted to give today, and I thank you for your attention.